The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times, and with many, many notes. So, I hope you all had a good Christmas. I decided the best way to spend my Christmas was to watch 1,500 people drowning and freezing to death in the North Atlantic, <laughs> courtesy of the 1996 Titanic miniseries. If you don't know this one, if you're thinking, well, hang on, do you mean the 1997? Like, no, 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 the, <laughs> there was a miniseries in 1996, the year before. <laughs> In fact, it's quite funny, I was, um, the entire thing is online, by the way, because I don't think they care about copyright at this point, which is fine for me. Hopefully I won't get copyright claim when I do the this week for the next Titanic rant. There was a funny comment somebody um, put in the thing saying, uh, like, Mum, can we watch um, t James Cameron's Titanic? I was like, oh, don't worry, son, but we've, we've got uh, Titanic at home. And Titanic at home, and <laughs> it's this miniseries. So, yeah, like, um, the thing is, it's difficult to find out about the history of this miniseries and how it came into production. From what I can gather, it was basically... Uh, James Cameron, I think in about 95, started making Titanic, the, the famous one. Um, I'm sure it was 95, because I think he died on the wreck that year, or was it the next year? It might be 96. Either way, he was in the process of, of making it, but it went through a lot of delays, and apparently, from what I can ascertain, C CBS, I think it was, decided to rush a TV movie into production to get ahead of it, um, of the main movie, then try and, you know, see if they could get a bit of, um, um, you know, uh, how, well, how to put this, leech off of the attention, <laughs> I suppose. But, again, I've, I've tried looking across the internet for, well, this was 1996, so this is very early days of the internet, but there's very little about the actual making of it. Uh, there's a few little bits here and there that um, I'll mention, but... Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I had seen this one when I was a, a kid as well. I think the last time I saw it was about 12 or 13. So there's a lot of things I'd forgotten though. But <laughs> so uh, I'm only just going to be reading off a lot of my um, my notes and so on. Overall, I think I actually think this one was slightly better than the 2012 uh, Julian Fellows version. I know that might sound sacrilegious, but it's like at least this one was. It, it's bad. Don't get me. It's really bad. We'll get into that in a moment. At least it was a little more felt like the Titanic. Like they did some of the rooms they had somewhat tried. Like the Grand Staircase does kind of look like the one in the Titanic, even if it's the wrong colour and it's got a chandelier and it's actually like, no, I see where you're going with that. And uh, whereas Julian Fellow's one is just it's it's Downton Abbey on sea and occasionally and right at the end they remind you, oh yeah, we're on the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, we have a load of fictional characters because as we all know, there's you know we can't make, have any historical people in the Titanic because they weren't interesting, you know, we've got to make them up. <laughs> so the main the main uh, three plot lines, well, I, uh, there is a few historicals, I'll get to them in a moment. The three three main ones you follow, there's the the first one is Catherine Zeta-Jones, pre her becoming really famous, I think she was kind of TV famous at this point, um, this is before, I think Zorro was 98, so she's more just doing TV production at this point, who plays, that's the first main plot line, she plays a lady in first class who is married with a kid and she's on her way back to America, uh, but her husband and her daughter are in America, and she bumps into her old boyfriend, um, and she's antagonistic at first, and then they fall in love, but he dies, um, and then, you know, she suffers no consequences for her action because he dies on the Titanic and she's fine at the end of the film. Even though she apparently sent a telegram to her husband saying she was going to leave him and go run off with the boyfriend, but they didn't send it out because of the, the iceberg hit, so that was lucky. <laughs> um, It's... It's very cliche. It's a pretty bad storyline, but it's it's passable. It's passable compared to the Julian Fellow stuff. Then we actually get to historical uh, characters, which are the Allisons. Um, if I, I'm probably saying that wrong, which I briefly mentioned in uh, the last Tudor rank, because they do they're briefly in this one, which makes me think Julian Fellows might have watched this version and copied a lot of elements. Perhaps I'll get to that a bit later, maybe. <laughs> Um, so if you the Allison family, they were, well I think the Hudson Allison was Canadian, his wife Bess was American, but they obviously moved to Canada. Um, they go back on the Titanic and they had a two year old girl, Lorraine, and there's a uh, ten month, well two nearly three, and ten month old son Trevor. Um, a few weeks before the ship sets out, they'd hired a new nursemaid, um, who's called Alice Cleaver. This is where, this is probably one of the worst plot, historical plot lines related in this miniseries. Because some somebody got muddled up and thought Alice Clee muddled Alice Cleaver with another Alice Cleaver who was a murderer, who was an insane asylum at that point. So this one has her be from an insane asylum, and she constantly has nightmares about killing her own child. Then she kind of go she has like goes kind of hysterical and runs off with baby Trevor, and then that basically helps lead to the Allison's the rest of the Allison family's deaths because then they try and find them, but it's too late. 
Which, by the way, it's funny. Like when they the final scenes, they they see Captain Smith and they're like, "Oh, is there any lifeboats left?" Like, Sorry, there's none at all. And he's like, "Oh, well, thank you, Smith, for comforting this family in the final hours." But it's like, but then that's not true though, because there were still the two collapsible boats. Like, uh, and actually, the funny thing is, I uh, one we're not hundred percent sure. I'll I'll do a bit on the Allison family in the video. There was one account that they might have been trying to get into one of the collapsibles right at the end when the final plunge happened, but then they were thrown out and, and lost, obviously. So, well done <laughs> for getting all that wrong. But yeah, so that's that plot line not as good either. Uh, not to mention they found they get it reversed where they portrayed the um, like I mentioned the, the nurse as being like insane uh, when actually her account she didn't she was very quiet after the um, the sinking she didn't leave many accounts. The only one was a letter she wrote to Walter Lord in the fifties, I think fifty five. I'll probably look that up for the video. And she basically said that it was more like the other way around, that she'd heard there was the collision. She tried to get her, the husband, uh, Bess, um, what was that? Hudson Allison, he went to go and see what was wrong eventually. And Bess, and she tried to sort of, meanwhile, while that he was gone, a uh, steward came around and said to get up on deck. She tried to get Bess moving, but um, Bess sort of got a bit hysterical at that point. So she then eventually they managed to get going um, towards the deck, but they got separated. That's how, in the end, she got put into a lifeboat. But there's still a bit of mystery around it, so we'll I'll definitely explore that further. Um, then there's the third a historical the plot, which is a very you know again um, made up. We have a third class passenger who uh, falls in love with the Danish girl, um, who I thought was Elsa. <laughs> <laughs> I might still make that joke in the video, maybe, but it's, it's Asa, I think her name is. It feels very much like Jack from Titanic. In fact, the funny thing is, I've heard some suggest that it's possible when they're making this, somebody might have been an insider in James Cameron's production and was perhaps feeding a few plot lines to this version, which they then nicked. It does make one wonder, because there's a funny thing, like, originally in Titanic, from what I understand, when they had the Murdoch shooting scene, because um, in the film, how it portrays out, he... Cal Hockley, I've not seen Titanic for years, but just got off my memory. Cal Hockley uh, is bribed, he bribes Murdoch. Murdoch later just flings it back in his face. And then, then that happens, you know, he shoots a couple of people and eventually salutes and shoots himself. In the original version, he was just going to be bribed. He wasn't even going to refuse it. And then when he shoots himself, he was going to like fall flat in the water and be like surrounded by money. But fortunately, there was somebody on the set had a word with the actor playing Murdoch. And then they had a word with Cameron saying, that's kind of really disrespectful to Murdoch, you know. <laughs> So they changed it, thankfully. In this version, though, there's um, Tim Curry, <laughs> who's really hammy. It was one of the few interesting parts of this. Uh, not interesting, sorry, funny. <laughs> um, he plays a steward who goes around robbing the cabins when the ship's sinking, dresses up as a Monty Python character to escape in the lifeboat, and then eventually they, he, he tries to hold the lifeboat at gunpoint, and eventually the officer whacks him with an oar, and he falls out. And he's laying in the water surrounded by money, much like, huh. Oh. Much like that was in the original Cameron script. And there's other bits as well, like some of the dialogue. Like when the iceberg hits, Murdoch, he's saying, oh, come on, turn, turn. Which you don't usually see in other Titanic ones before then. But that's in James Cameron's one. It's in this as well. Uh, and then the Mur Murdoch shoots himself in this one as well. And it's probably one of the worst <laughs> versions of it I've ever seen. So, again, I've got to be careful. I don't want to be sued by CBS. Um, I'm... If, if anybody, by the way, can find out any information on the making of this series, please send it to me. Um, either you know on here or on my Twitter or Facebook or something. Uh, I would like to know for the you know for the um, the making of section of this because I want to know exactly what was going on here. Uh, oh yeah, while we're on the subject of Tim Curry, that's actually does lead to the worst scene in the entire thing. He decides to rape the Danish girl in the shower. And when I saw this as a kid, I think they must have cut this scene um, for daytime television because it's very long and not graph um, not graphic per se, but long. And you're just like. Why was this in here? This is really bad. <laughs> what is it we just, like, you decide to have... you got this ship with 2,200 people on it. Loads of drama, and you think, hmm, that's not dramatic enough. I know, rape scene. That's a good idea. I mean, at least it's a bit better set up than the, you know, the Henry VIII one. Even so, it's sort of like, why? It's Tim Curry. I know he's playing an evil character. It's Tim Curry. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, oh, yeah, and they continue on with some of the historical characters, because, uh, sorry, I meant to concentrate on the... The non-historical ones, but I'm blending and going back and forth a bit. Bruce Ismay is portrayed as being basically responsible for speeding the ship up. It, the old meme, you know, which didn't really happen. <laughs> There's The only real evidence we have is a female pastor. I forget her name. I'll pop it up on screen. She was uh, having tea one day, and on the table next to her was Captain Smith and Bruce Ismay, and they were, they were having a cup of tea. Apparently, during this conversation, um, 
Ismay was reading out some information. He was like, oh, we did X amount of miles uh, yesterday. We've done X today. I suspect we might be in um, New York by Tuesday or something like that. And Smith didn't say anything about it during this conversation. And that was it. you know. And he was sometimes a bit braggy to some of the passengers. But that got interpreted sort of as like, oh, yeah, he's trying to speed the ship up, which he couldn't do because he's, he's chairman of the line, but he's not running the ship. <laughs> and he certainly wasn't visiting the boiler rooms like he is in this series, which is just like, oh, God. Although I must say, I think... I think I think it's better than the the fellow's version where he's trying to murder a load of Italian people. That's... So anyway, and then Captain Smith, again, while I'm on the subject, the casting is weird, because they've got, um, is it George Scott? Uh, you know, played General Patton, an American actor, and he's playing Captain Smith, who is British. And he doesn't even try with the accent, so he's just like, why? <laughs> um, not least because his character is just, they try, they just make him completely blameless for the sinking. It, it's, they kind of merge him with Thomas, because Thomas Andrews is, doesn't exist in this one. And he's, you know, he says like, oh, you should have, um, you know, you should have just sideswiped the iceberg because, you know, as you know, the natural instinct is, yeah, let's ram an iceberg head on <laughs> and stuff like that. In fact, half the casting in this is all backwards. Like I was looking this up, like there's, there's this is um, the third class Danish girl. For some reason, she's traveling with this religious family and they never specify what they are. They're Christian of some sort, but they don't say. So uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, something like that. And they're all played by Canadians. But they're, but they're playing English roles. And the, the father in particular has a terrible accent. It's some weird mishmash of Irish, Yorkshire, and maybe West Country. And then some of these lines are hilarious. Like, what was the one? Um, oh, I've got it written down my notes somewhere. Oh, yeah. the Right, the, it's basically this third-class family, the Jacks, I think they call themselves. And according to TV tropes, they were originally meant to be the Goodwin family. I don't know if this is true. Again, this is why I want to verify this. But they changed it for some reason. They come up on the deck at the last, you know, like, minutes before the ship sinks, so they're not in time to get on the lifeboat. And in, in his terrible accent, he says, "'Tis a cruel joke to have left our lives in Dorchester for this." <laughs> it's like, what a weird line. That doesn't sound natural. Like, you, when you, like your family's about to die, and you, you sound like a Shakespearean character on the stage. <laughs> I mean, that's one thing with a lot of the dialogue in this. It's very like they're saying their feelings and not emoting them, if you understand me. <laughs> there was another funny line that's not aged well. Uh, when they're boarding the Titanic, the family, they're, um, they're, uh, they're getting on and they're having a conversation with the guy, you know, letting them on. And, and the mother says, oh, we're no simps. And I was like, oh, the meaning of that word has changed in 25 years. <laughs> I was halfway through drinking a glass of water at the time. So you can imagine how that went. Actually, is there any more backwards casting? Just while I'm thinking about it. Uh, well, I mean, obviously Catherine Zeta-Jones is British, and she's playing an American. Like I said, and you know, George Scott's playing Captain Smith. Um, <laughs> uh, Tim Curry plays an Irish. He's he's an Irish steward, and so you got Tim Curry, an English actor, and a with a bad Irish accent. It's so weird. I don't understand. And then, um, I, was, I do have to be a little bit forgiving. It's 1996, but a lot of the CGI is so bad in this. Like I'll pop a few screenshots up on the screen. Just like, oh, that does look really bad. It, it's aged. It's not aged well. <laughs> Obviously, again, it's a TV movie from '96. This is years after this sort of started really becoming common in production, so I can't be too harsh. Oh, can I? Yes, I can. <laughs> um, I'm also. I think it was better structured than Fellows, well, mainly because it helps. It's chronological. You know, I'm not having to go back and forth all the time like with that one. Um, the first part is just sort of leading up to the sinking, and it ends with it hitting the iceberg. And then the second half is just the sinking. First half is a bit, uh, you know, it's like, okay, and then, then it goes a bit, oh, this is boring. And then it picks up again, it's boring, uh, you know. The second half's not, you know, it's a bit more, like, once the sinking's going, there's a bit more stuff happening. Um, it's got a fair fill of inaccuracies, though, which I, I'll go into detail. You know, things like, you know, they're having the... Um, the passengers are all quite neatly organised. You know, Captain Smith has, you know, the, the usual the officers' conference, you know, where it's like, you know, Mr. Lightholler, you do this, da-da-da-da. When it was nothing like that on the Titanic, it was a bit more, a little more chaotic. <laughs> what else have I got to say? Um, I've got more to say. I mean, I made 4,000 words of notes, roughly. <laughs> and there's plenty to, there's plenty to criticise. You'll hear it in the full rant video, but, um, yeah, for now, I think I'll leave it at that. Like, as I say, if anybody can find any information about the making of this, there's any interviews with the cast, please send them to me. I am struggling to find anything other than a few like TV reviews of it after it came out, and just a few bits of here, here and there on the internet. Like as I mentioned, that the Goodwin, they were meant to be the Jack family, were meant to be called the Goodwin family. 
and that they um, managed to rip off Titanic. But again, I don't know because this is just stuff that's stated online. This can mean anything. Yeah, and so I, I'm really sorry as well. This might come out around about New Year. I'm sorry I've really slowed down with the videos at the moment. I've, I'm getting along with Tudor Round 5. I'm at fifth, no, 16,000 words, was I? I can't remember. I think about 15,000 last I checked, which is I'm nearly at the length of Tudor Round 3. I'm nowhere near finished yet, so we're going to be looking about 20,000 words for that script. And then this, I'm going to write the script for this one. I've got the Q&A video recorded. I've got the Waterloo review recorded. I, I, last year I recorded that, and I've still not fully edited it yet. Um, the Princess Principle video, I'm, um, I've not recorded that yet, but I will do, because I'm, I'm conscious the film comes out in February, and I want to get that video out done before then. And then I've got this one I want to get done in April. Then I want the Titanic Tudor rant done as soon as possible. And I want the Waterloo <laughs> review one done. So I'm going to be very busy for the next few months. But, uh, yeah, anyway, hope you have... Well, depends when this one comes out. If either have a good New Year or hope you've had a good New Year and Christmas, depending what happens. Anyway, so this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.